Hello everybody and welcome back to another Know Your Ship episode and today's episode is going to be on the Graf Spee. Now I have done a Deutschland class episode before but it was an older one and I didn't really do much of the narration so this one's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to be doing all of it. So come on sit around and let me tell you the story of the Graf Spee. See towards the end of the First World War uh, Germany was pretty much a total mess, and with the Treaty of Versailles signed, she was forced to reduce her military and pay the Allied nations tons and tons and tons of money. Something in the range of five billion dollars back in the 1920s. Yeah, billion with the capital B. That's roughly, if you adjust for inflation, about 121 billion dollars today. Because, according to the treaty, Germany was solely responsible for starting World War I. So, after her military gets wrecked, her economy gets wrecked, you'd figure people aren't really too, too happy with this. And so, cue World War II in about 20 years' time. But that, unfortunately, is a story for another day. Her navy was limited to a handful of pre-dreadnoughts, couple light cruisers, and destroyers. Any new ships, according to the Treaty of Versailles, that she was to build could not exceed 10,000 tons, and guns could not be larger than 28 centimeters. So basically, Germany could not build any battleships to challenge any of the Allied nations because they had fully fledged battleships. The rest of the world, of course, uh, also had their economy sort of ruined, so they all signed on to the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited battleship displacement to 35,000 tons and then limited cruisers to 10,000 tons with guns no larger than 20 centimeters. So, in 1926, the Germans were looking at potentially building some new ships. They looked at the restrictions and said, well, hang on a minute here. What if we built a ship that can absolutely whip everything that went faster and then run the hell away from anything that is stronger? So, with some awesome German ingenuity, they went ahead and designed the Panzerschiffs of the Deutschland class, which the Graf Spee is one of them. These ships totally outgunned any of the Washington Treaty heavy cruisers, and of course their 20 centimeter guns, while being able to completely outrun battleships, the only exception being the battle cruisers such as the Renown and the Congo classes, and of course HMS Hood. Obviously, the countries that signed on to the Washington Naval Treaties weren't exactly too thrilled with Germany going ahead and basically building a ship that, well, could beat up all their cruisers, so they wanted to stop it. Of course, Germany was actually okay with this, because what Germany really wanted to do was to design a ship, have the Allied nations go, Oh, okay, we don't really want to, yeah, we don't really want you to have those. How about you just kind of step in line here and join up with the Washington Naval Treaty? And Germany really wanted to do that, and they were even willing to accept the lowest ratio of naval ship tonnage of 1.25. The ratio for the other nations were 5 for both the US and Great Britain, 3 for Japan, and 1.75 for both France and Italy. So Germany was actually okay with having the lowest tonnage. But there's, there's a key point here. Entry into the Washington Naval Treaty would allow Germany, of course, to build battleships and heavy cruisers, and would have essentially modified the Versailles Treaty limitations. Well, now, of course, you have some disagreement with all the countries that signed on to the Washington Naval Treaty. Some wanted Germany to be a part of the treaty, and of course, there was one major country that absolutely did not accept that condition, being the French. So Germany said, well, okay, you don't want us in the Washington Naval Treaty, we're just going to stick with the Versailles Treaty, and we're not violating anything. And so they were allowed to proceed. Of course, the French, not wanting to be outdone, did build ships to counter the German Panzer ships, and that was building the two Dunkirk-class battlecruisers. The Admiral Graf Spee was one of three completed Deutschland-class panzer ships, and probably the most famous ship of this class. She was laid down on the 1st of October 1932 and commissioned on the 6th of January 1936, and she packed some pretty big guns for a ship of this tonnage. A total of six 28cm guns in two triple turrets. They could fire a 300kg shell with a starting muzzle velocity of 910 meters per second to a maximum range of approximately 36 kilometers, with a rate of fire of approximately two and a half rounds a minute. So, how much bigger are these shells, you ask, compared to the heavy cruisers? Well, 
the 20 centimeter heavy cruiser guns that most of the navies had in the world, and especially the British, through a comparatively puny 116 kilogram shell. In a straight up fight against the heavy cruiser, the Graf Spee with a shell weight that's essentially three times more than what the heavy cruiser could throw back, could easily wreck the much more weakly armed ships. The ship also carried eight 15 centimeter secondary guns, which were larger than the guns carried by most British destroyers. And another important thing to keep in mind, actually, because this is going to influence something a little bit later. These 15 centimeter guns could throw a 45 kilogram shell out to about 23 kilometers. British destroyers, let's say armed with 12 centimeter guns, could only reply with 22 kilogram shells, again half the weight, to around 15.5 kilometers. The Graf Spee also had some A guns, notably 6 to 10.5 centimeter guns, and also 8 533 millimeter torpedoes. To keep the ship's weight down, the armor on the Graf Spee was sufficient to deal with cruisers, but not anything really bigger than that. So again, the idea of seeing something bigger and running the hell away applies to this particular ship. Her belt armor was between 60 to 80 millimeters thick, deck armor was up to a maximum of 45 millimeters. The gun turrets had armor between 85 millimeters on the side to 140 millimeters on the face. While not great, it was at least comparable or better than most of the heavy cruisers at the time. The Graf Spee was also equipped with diesel engines. And why is this special? Why are diesel engines special? And well, they did provide a few additional benefits over steam driven ships and well, those benefits would also play a role in uh, confrontations a little bit later. First of all, they required less men to operate, so yay, less engineering crew. They also took up less space, so additional weight savings accomplished there. And finally, they sipped fuel. And this gave the Graf Spee a phenomenal operational range of 20,000 nautical miles at 18 knots. Furthermore, in actual fights, they actually could get to the ship to maximum speed in significantly less time than other ships at the time. In fact, with the diesels, uh, the Graf Spee could have a speed advantage for about a good 15 minutes before the other ships could actually get up to speed. So this is a huge tactical advantage, because let's say you're running away from something, you have a good 15 minute head start. So even against battle cruisers that were pretty fast, you had a 15 minute head start and well, it's hard for other ships to chase you down. The Graf Spee was also equipped with radar in 1938, a first on the German warship. But the radar wasn't really all that good for fire control, since it wasn't really good at figuring out which direction the target was going at, so that's not very useful. It could at least figure out range, so that was something, right? The Graf Spee also carried some Arado AR-196 floatplanes for recon, something essential for a commerce raider. As World War II was about to start, ships like the Graf Spee were ordered to their operational areas before the formal start of war. Their role was to engage in a trade war in shipping lanes, with the main focus being against England. Ships were ordered not to engage with enemy units in order to prolong their operations and cause as much disruption as possible, because even little tiny bits of damage could potentially put a commerce raider out of action. A very valuable lesson learned by the Germans, mind you, after a number of operations in World War I were stopped because ships simply got damaged or got hit by something and that was the end of their operation. They had to go back for repairs. Finally, on the 26th of September, so practically a month after the start of war, of September 1939, Captain Hans Lonsdorf was given the clearance to begin operations. However, a major concern started to pop up at around this time. Now, at first it didn't really affect things much, but at the end, this is one of those things that really comes up and bites you in the butt. So, there was a major concern that the engines on the Graf Spee were reaching the recommended total running hours and required some dockyard overhaul, but they were kind of out on deployment, so they weren't really going to get back any day soon, so the engineers would have to sort of make do with whatever they can to keep her running until they could get home. The Graf Spee's first success actually came relatively soon. On the 30th of September, they found a steamship, the SS Clement. Found around 1 in the afternoon, the scalplane actually managed to stop the ship, but couldn't stop it from transmitting a distress call. The British Admiralty had basically figured out that maybe we're going to have to be dealing with some commerce raiders, and told all merchant ships that if they were stopped by a warship to quickly send distress calls. 
for as long as humanly possible, destroy all essential documents, and also wreck the engines so the ship could not be used as a supply ship for the raider. This was actually a pretty smart strategy by the British Admiralty, and would actually force the captain and the crew of the German raider to come up with some, let's say, unorthodox solutions. The Admiralty was at first unaware that the Grafschi was actually the ship responsible. But finally, the crew of the Clement reached port on the 1st of October and went, Oh my god, we ran into a German raider! And of course, the Admiralty was like, Uh-oh, we gotta send out something. So they sent out 800 kilograms. And this is one of the major advantages of ships like the Graf Spee, is that they tie down a huge amount of naval forces to basically deal with one single ship. For Germany, who didn't exactly have the biggest navy by the time World War II rolled around, well, they could have been easily completely blockaded by France and England. However, having raiders drawing off forces left and right, it could alleviate some of the pressure that Germany would be feeling from a naval blockade. Alright, so back to an earlier point about these ingenious solutions that the crew had to come up with in order to deal with this British strategy. And so what they did was they started painting parts of the main mast a lighter color while darkening the sides. Now this led the ship to have an appearance of having a tripod. Well, why is that important, you ask? Well, see, from certain angles, this changed the appearance of the ship at a distance. At 7 o'clock in the morning on the 5th of October, the Graf Bay approached the steamship Newton Beach, bow on, and told her to stop and also to maintain radio silence. By the time the captain of the Newton Beach realized that the Kraftspray was a German raider and not what he initially thought was a French warship because of those tripod mass looking paint from a distance, um, well, it was too late to do everything. Uh, he couldn't destroy everything, couldn't wreck the engine room, couldn't do a whole bunch of things. Well, now the secret instructions that British Admiralty had sent to all these merchant ships had been discovered. And of course, this provided the Kraftspray with some very valuable intelligence. Not only that, but a Marconi radio transmitter was also captured, along with those pieces of intelligence. So, now what the Graf Spee would start doing is broadcasting false distress signals all over the place to throw the British off. The Newton Beach's call for help was actually picked up by another ship, which actually managed to relay the message to HMS Cumberland. But since the message didn't really have a specific code in it about finding a raider, the Cumberland didn't break radio silence. A valuable opportunity to hunt down the Graf Bay early on was totally missed. The Graf Bay continued to stalk around the oceans, pouncing on unsuspecting merchant ships here and there, who most of them thought, hey look, there's a French warship approaching us until the very last minute. On the 7th of October, Ashley was caught and sunk. On the 10th, the Huntsman was captured as well. Now, the Huntsman was too large of a ship, and they would have to return to her at a later date to deal with her crew and her cargo so they left a prize crew on board. Not wanting to stay in the same area, the Graf Spee decided to go meet up with the Altmark, her supply ship, and transfer some of the prisoners. Lonsdorf messaged the naval operations staff in Berlin and told them of his plans and tried to persuade the senior staff to allow for some relaxation of the rules about not engaging enemy surface combatants. To basically, which the senior naval staff said, ah, uh, no, you're not going to risk your ship, you're going to stick to the plan and avoid any kind of confrontation. So, Lansdorf just did what he was ordered for now and kept dealing with just individual merchant ships. Alright, so, on the 15th of October, the Graf Spee met up with the Altmark. However, <laughs> in an interesting note, they forgot to tell the Altmark Hey, by the way, we painted our ship differently, and it looks different now. And so they scared the crap out of the Altmar crew, who all of a sudden thought, Oh my god, we stumbled upon a French warship. The two ships then, of course, rendezvoused and then returned to the Huntsman to offload the raw materials and additional prisoners. Once this was done, Grash Base set off once again, and this time towards the Cape of Good Hope near South Africa, hoping to find new ships to prey on. On the 22nd of October, the Graf Spee found a new victim, the MV Trevanian, who managed to get a message out but failed to send the ship's position. This, of course, led the British commander-in-chief of South Atlantic Station to basically go, Okay, here's the new raider position, throw everything that he had into that area. And that included an aircraft carrier, the battlecruiser Renown, and the French battlecruiser Strasbourg. Had these ships been able to chase to their heart's content, it was a pretty good chance they would have caught the Graf Spee. 
except senior naval officer at Simonstown sent out a message that U-boats were at a particular position where the Graf Spree actually was. Well, this immediately caused the pursuers to be just a tiny little bit more cautious because U-boats are serious stuff. And so the Graf Spree slipped away again. However, by the 28th of October, Captain Lonsdorf believed it was a pretty good idea to now make an appearance just south of Madagascar and throw the Allied ships off for another loop. And then, of course, once that was done, turn around and start heading back to home because the engines, well, they really needed to be overhauled. And according to the engineers, they could last at most until the end of January. For pretty much the next two weeks, the Graf Spee just kind of hung around Madagascar hoping for something to sink. At times, they even considered maybe we should just go ahead and bombard South Africa. Maybe we'll send out a scout plane and bomb them a little bit and maybe that will get the attention of the British. Finally, on the 15th of November, the Graf Spee managed to sink a small British motor tanker, the Africa Shell. Even though Captain Langsdorff wasn't satisfied at all with sinking such a small ship, it certainly set off some alarm bells as the senior naval officer Durbin immediately issued a warning about a German raider in the Indian Ocean. This led Force H and Force K to hunt the Graf Spee around South Africa, but to absolutely no avail since the Graf Spee had already met up with the Altmark and was heading in the complete opposite direction back into the Atlantic. During this break in the action, the Graf Spee would construct a dummy second gun turret and an extra funnel. From a distance, this changed her appearance so that she would look like a British cruiser. Get ready, a couple more merchant ships are going to fall for this. On the 24th of November, Langsdorf notified the officers that his ship, uh, the Graf Spee, would really have to return to Germany to get an engine overhaul done. However, while in the past they had to avoid any kind of confrontation with any armed ship, this time they were going to go and pick on a larger convoy even if it had an armed escort. And the reason why Longsdorf decided to do this was that he saw that the commerce raiding operation had sort of already wrapped up as he was heading back home, and he wanted to bring back a significant victory. Plus, because of Graf Spee's activities, the South Atlantic was becoming home to ever-increasing amounts of Allied warships. And Langsdorff wasn't really sure that another raider could come back to the South Atlantic and operate. So, wanted to do something uh, extravagant, wanted to do something great. On his way back, Langsdorff sank the freighter, the Doric Star, and the Tyroa. On the 7th of December, the Graf Spee captured her last victim, the, oh, I cannot get this name properly, but I'll try, the Stronschel, I think, or something like that. This capture also provided some secret documents, which showed shipping routes and the prospect of bagging that big prize. And that was way too alluring to Captain Lonsdorf, who really wanted to nab that last big prize before going home. And with this, headed towards the River Plate. Intelligence from Naval Operations Staff in Berlin on the 9th of December well further reinforced that belief because they told Lonsdorf that there was a four-ship convoy leaving Montevideo escorted by nothing more than an auxiliary ship. The hunt was on, and the Graf Spee immediately put her scout plane to work. However, the AR-196 was actually the first production plane off the line and had tons of problems. And finally, after being patched up numerous times prior to this day, the plane completely broke down and was tossed overboard on the 11th of December. So now the Graf Spee no longer has a scout. This is also going to hurt her. The ship, now deprived of that aerial reconnaissance, prowled the area from the 12th to 13th of December. At 0530 on the morning of the 13th, two masts appeared in the distance. Navigation officer wanted to avoid engagements with enemy ships, but Longsdorf was convinced that it was the escorts for the convoy and chose to pursue battle. At 0552 that morning, the heavy cruiser HMS Exeter could be clearly made out. The other two ships, however, were misidentified, and there would be hell to pay for this mistake. The reason there was a misidentification occurred was that the two light cruisers, HMS Ajax and Achilles, were the only cruisers in that class in the Royal Navy with only a single funnel, which is typically an identifying trait of British destroyers. Thinking that the enemy squadron was a single heavy cruiser and two destroyers, Lonsdorf opted for combat. Now remember how I was talking about the guns earlier? The 
uh, Graf Spee had 15 centimeter secondary guns, and that could easily deal with the 12 centimeter destroyer guns that Lonsdorf assumed that he was facing. However, when it was realized that the ships were light cruisers armed with 15 centimeter guns, the Graf Spee, well, that was too late to run away, and they were going to be in trouble. So, Lonsdorf, realizing that there was no longer a chance of escape, decided that, you know what, we're just going to go in there and try to fight our way out. So, ordered the ship to full speed, and again, remember the advantage of those diesel engines allowed the Graf Spee to have a speed advantage on those British cruisers. At 0600, smoke was spotted aboard the British cruisers, and HMS Exeter was sent to recon the smoke. 16 minutes later, Exeter reported that she had spotted a pocket battleship, and at 0617, the Graf Spee opened fire on HMS Exeter with her main guns, and on the light cruisers with her secondary guns. The British formation, which had actually practiced for such an engagement, immediately split up. So the Exeter went one way, and the Ajax and the Achilles went in a different direction. At 0620, HMS Exeter opened up in reply with her 203mm guns. The Ajax would follow at 0621, and the Achilles at 0624. The Graf Spee's shooting wasn't all that good, but when her shells hit home, they hit home with devastating effect. Within a half hour of opening up on HMS Exeter, the Graf Spee had hit Exeter with three shells that disabled both forward guns and absolutely wrecked the bridge. The light cruisers, now trying to relieve pressure on the Exeter, which was massively in trouble, closed in rapidly. Lanzor, fearing a torpedo attack from the light cruisers, turned his ship away, and this allowed the Exeter to momentarily withdraw. The Graf Spee now turns attention to the light cruisers, which themselves immediately realized they were in trouble and tried to run away and deployed smoke. And this caused the Graf Spee to have to constantly shift targets, and not many hits were scored there. The Exeter returned at around 0700, firing now with only her rear turret, but not too long after the Exeter returned, well, the Graf Spee hit her again, and the Exeter now only had one functioning gun and had to retire once again. The light cruisers too returned to try to deliver torpedoes, but Ajax ate a few 28cm shells, putting both aft turrets out of action. By 0725, only three guns remained operational on board HMS Ajax, leading British Commodore Henry Harwood to break off the engagement by changing course and deploying smoke. The Graf Spee also broke off the engagement, having been hit numerous times, suffering 36 dead and 60 wounded, including the captain. Battle damage of the Graf Spee was severe. The ship could not make it back to Germany because she was just not seaworthy enough to survive the rough conditions in the North Atlantic. To make things even worse, a shell had also destroyed the filtration equipment for fuel and lubricating oil. And here's where something is going to come back and bite them in the butt, is that without properly filtered oil, the engines, which were in desperate need of an overhaul, could not now be depended to hold out until the ship could reach Germany. Captain Lonsdorf had absolutely no choice whatsoever except to put the Graf Spee into Montevideo and ask the Uruguayan government for enough time to repair a ship. Well, the Uruguayan government, they sent an expert team onto the ship, which evaluated the ship and said they required about 14 days to repair them, and then of course granted them only 48 hours. The German ambassador protested this 48 hours, and it was extended to 72 hours. It was during this stage that the war shifted from a military war to a bit of a political war. The British ambassador at the time, Millington Drake, wanted to keep the German ship in port for the full 72-hour duration, or as long as possible. So, to prevent the ship from leaving port, and also so that British reinforcements could arrive. All Millington Drake had to do was send out an English or French freighter approximately every 24 hours in order to prevent the raider from leaving for another 24 hours, as dictated by neutrality laws. The Graf Bay was absolutely cornered, stuck inside Montevideo Harbor, waiting essentially for British warships to gather to sink her. Captain Lonsdorf knew that he was in trouble. His ship could not be fully repaired no longer had enough ammunition to fight her way out, and not being able to leave harbor just kept giving the enemy more time to bring reinforcements. He feared that a ship would simply go out and get herself shot to pieces, and the crew would pay a horrible price for that, while being essentially defenseless. This would also be made worse by the fact that the shallow waters in the area would also allow the enemy then to capture important equipment on the ship, some of which, like the radar, were essentially top secret items at the time. 
Lonsdorf went around, consulted with the senior staff, and decided on the 17th of December at 0300 to destroy all critical components and to scuttle a ship. At 18.20 that afternoon, the ship raised anchor, left port, and sailed for her anchorage just outside Uruguayan territorial waters. The ship's remaining ammunition, which wasn't that much, had been placed at key points throughout the ship, and time blasting charges were put on the torpedoes to start off the explosions. Right around sunset, the Graf Spee went up in smoke and fire as the time charges went off. The ship's crew arrived in Buenos Aires on the 18th of December and were interned. And early on the 20th of December, Captain Lonsdorf, in his full dress uniform, lying on a ship's battle ensign, committed suicide. And thus ends the story of the Graf Spee and her captain, Hans Lonsdorf. I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and I would of course like to thank my patrons for supporting me and making it possible for me to spend considerable time to make these episodes. You folks are absolutely amazing people, and I truly, truly appreciate your support. And aside from all that, folks, take care, everybody, and I'm looking forward to talking to all of you again soon.